1695 online at cspan.org slash products or call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. Coming up next, a House hearing on cybersecurity. Witnesses include a computer hacker and government officials. They talk about steps the federal government and private sector should take to protect information on computer networks. This is just over two hours. cybersecurity policies and structures of our government. Already we have heard a push and pull going on behind the scenes and increasingly in public about some of the thorniest questions that that panel will consider. Today we will offer some advice. Uh, this committee will have the jurisdiction to implement the policies that are recommended by the President and notwithstanding the activities in some other committees which we welcome the jurisdiction for these matters will be here in the Telecommunications Subcommittee and in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, we will hear from a brilliant set of witnesses, but we will not hear from someone from the administration for some reasons obvious and some reasons not so. The obvious reason is I don't think they know yet what their policies will be, so asking them to testify on them might be premature, but also we wanted by design to have a conversation here among interested parties in the, uh, in the community uh, that would allow us to inform our reactions to the, the ad administration's proposals that will be forthcoming. In fact, cybersecurity is not a singular problem. It is at least three. There are, of course, the issues of personal security, uh, issues of spam and nuisance, but also identity theft and the like. This is also an issue of critical infrastructure and protecting it, the economic security of our country and, frankly, the increasingly interconnected economies of all of the countries of the world. And of course, this is a national security issue, an issue that has been seemingly increasingly brought to the public's attention with stories that fill up the newspapers on everything from fighter jet plans being stolen to Chinese-based uh, uh, Chinese spying on Tibet and so many other countries. We have heard just about a story a day we will endeavor to ask and answer some of the big questions that the President is going to be wrestling with. How do we respond to or mitigate or work around or generally respond to the inherent paradox that is the Internet? It's openness. It's openness to innovation. It's openness to democratization. But also it's openness to mischief and mischief makers and often things worse than mischief. For the most part, Congress has been wise in resisting the temptation for heavy-handed intervention. And that has served the Internet well and has served our country well. We also have to ask the question that has been dominating the discussions at the White House, who should be in charge of combating the mischief maker, the con artists, or the terrorists? Not only what agency of government, but whether or not it should be government at all. And if so, what relationship between government and the private sector? With government, of course, you often get the inevitable heavy-handedness and secrecy, but you do get strong centralized action when it's needed. With the private sector, you get entrepreneurship, creativity, but you do also get silos of self-interest that don't always make for vigorous system-wide defense. One thing is sure, this cancer can't be exercised with a rusty ax. We need to use a scalpel. Third, we have to ask the questions, are we destined to constantly fight the last war when it comes to cybersecurity? Is the cycle of discovery, warning, insulation inevitable? Conficker gave us an interesting and good example of this. Tiffany of my staff put together for a timeline of the Conficker virus, and here's what she wrote. On December 12, uh, on, I'm sorry, December 29, 2008, Conficker B is first detected. Conficker A updates itself to Conficker B. 
February 20, 2009, Configure C is discovered. Configure B updates itself to Configure C. March 4, Configure D is discovered. Configure C updates itself to Configure D. April 7, 2009, Configure E is discovered. Configure D updates, updates itself to Configure E. Configure E downloads scareware and spyware onto computers. It deletes automatic updates of security systems and prompts a fake need to update one's computer. And when individuals buy the software protection Configure E offers, the computer downloads spyware onto the computer. This is a dynamic that clearly does not lend itself very well to discovering the problem, addressing the problem, moving on to the next problem. Maybe cat and mouse is our only option. Maybe, though, we don't need a military, a military type approach, but more approach that we in government use at, say, NIH or the, F or the Food and Drug Administration, where government helps to augment creative uh, solutions, help with some of the R&D, and then let the private sector go off and implement them. And then, of course, there are the more provocative questions that we might not have time to touch on today. Uh, such as John Markoff from the New York Times asking the question, do we need a new Internet altogether? Or the provocative title of Jonathan Zittrain's great book, The Future of the Internet and How We Stop It. The witnesses we have before us will offer us an opportunity to answer some, but not all, of these questions. This is a conversation that inevitably has to take place not only here in Congress, but in the businesses around the Internet, in the, in the coffee shops and parlors of people's personal experiences, and of course, over at the White House. Now it's my honor to introduce the witnesses we have before us today. Dan Kaminsky is the Director of Penetration Testing at IO Active, where he focuses on design capabilities and vulnerabilities of network protocols. He is probably most famous for having discovered a fundamental flaw in the domain name system, or DNS, that would have allowed him, that would allow to, him to reassign web addresses, take over banking sites, or disrupt the flow of data over the Internet. Thankfully, he was a good hacker and brought this flaw to the attention of those entities that were in a position to fix it. Dan Kaminsky, you are our first witness. You're recognized for five minutes. I know you've presented some testimony already, so feel free to summarize as you see as appropriate. Hello, everyone. Members of the subcommittee, please allow me to express my appreciation for offering me this opportunity to testify today. Um, I am, the, I am, as said, the Director of Penetration Testing at IOActive. I have spent the last 10 years of my career working with Fortune 500 companies, including Cisco, Avaya, and Microsoft, to help secure their systems. Um, it was an interesting experience that needed to be in a position to actually get the fix out, get the fix deployed, and ultimately protect the ecosystem. Uh, it was an example of a public-private partnership. We worked with U.S. CERT in order to get communication out to the federal agencies that themselves had to get uh, software out. And it was a remarkable, remarkable experience for all parties. Um, it was a highlight of 2008. 2008 was not, however, an easy year. Verizon Business actually every year puts out a report called the Data Breach Investigation Report. Uh, in an industry that always struggles to have good data to work with, Verizon actually did a wonderful thing and has for the last few years in summarizing what they see in their limited sample of their customer base. And what they saw was astonishing. Over 285 million records were compromised last year just, just from their customer base. According to Verizon, this is a more than every other year they would seen combined. Worse, over 91 percent of those compromised records, most of which were payment card information, over 91 percent of those were traced going back to organized crime. We have worldwide problems, um, and we live in a, in a much more dangerous world than when I first started doing computer security years ago. The reality is hacking is no longer about kids. It's about people with kids who would like to feed them. Attackers have had years to figure out the absolute best ways that they can monetize their access. 
Recently, they actually managed to coordinate a widespread attack against the ATM infrastructure in which in 49 cities, $9 million was extracted from ATMs using purloined ATM data. Beyond that, extortion, something we have almost no information on, is rumored to be becoming an extraordinary problem, not merely hitting the, the sides of the gambling or pornography aspects of the economy, but actually standard businesses. Um, as you mentioned, Conficker. Conficker, it turns out, was a remarkable success. If Conficker had come out in 2003, pretty much every single computer on the Internet, at least every Windows machine, would have been compromised. Since 2003, Windows has become a much, much more secure platform. The, uh, the actual result of the work from 2003 was I'll, probably over 99% of the machines that otherwise would have been affected, infected by Conficker, never had a problem. That's what happened when we, that is the results from our scans and our monitoring of the situation. Um, that being said, a percentage of a large number is still a large number, and we have had to deal with millions and millions of machines infected. What was most scary about Conficker is thus far, we still have no idea what the authors of it want. So where do most of these compromises come from? How is this happening? A lot of problems are in software. This is true. There's a lot of buggy software out there. But according to the Verizon Business Report, over 60% of actual penetrations that led to loss of data did not come from buggy code. They came from our simple inability to strongly authenticate other nodes on the Internet. Default passwords, lack of passwords, lack of insufficiently strong passwords, it turns out authentication is in huge amounts of trouble on the Internet today, and the data suggests it is leading directly to compromises of personal information. Now people may say, why are we still using passwords? Why is this problem still there? It turns out because it's the only way to reasonably make things work at all. It turns out if something doesn't work, people won't use it, even if it is theoretically more secure. This is ultimately why I've become a supporter of the technology known as DNSSEC. DNSSEC on its face is a method to fix DNS, but it's not just that. DNSSEC ultimately allows us to use DNS's power for allowing communication across organizational lines, ultimately trust across organizational lines, and allows us to apply cryptographic strength to that trust so it can be used not just for existing systems, or not just for locating systems, but for actually authenticating them, and ultimately authenticating the people on the other side. It will take some work, it will take a lot of work, but I see it as the key towards making a new security authenticating ecosystem. Thank you. Our next witness is uh, Rodney Jaffe, is the Senior Vice President and Senior Technologist for Newstar. He's a renowned expert on security flaws in the Internet. He also participated in the Department of Homeland Security Cyberstorm II, a multinational cybersecurity exercise that examines security preparedness and response capabilities across a variety of infrastructure. Mr. Jaffe, you're recognized for five minutes. You just turn on your microphone and pull it towards you. I'm the, as you said, the Senior Vice President and Senior Technologist for Newstar. Newstar uh, provides uh, innovative services that enable trusted communication across networks, uh, applications, enterprises around the world. A major portion of that is involvement with directories. I joined Newstar in 2006 when uh, UltraDNS, which was a company that I founded, was acquired by Newstar. Uh, DNS is the core directory that really routes traffic on the Internet. Every one of us uses it all the time. Any computing machine makes use of DNS. Uh, the technology itself uh, basically deals with the fact that uh, as humans, uh, we recognize we're able to use words. Computers understand numbers, in this particular case, IP addresses. And they require the IP addresses to be able to move traffic or to be able to get you from one site to another. The, the DNS, simply put, is the directory that converts names to numbers and vice versa. So for example, if I wanted to go to www.house.gov, uh, I'd put that into an internet browser, 
and the DNS would convert that to the IP address 204.141.87.18, and the computing device is then able to get you to the house server, and the screen appears uh, on uh, your computer. So Newstar also provides the core directory service for the .biz and the .us top-level domains, uh, as well as 17 other top-level domains, including a number of other country codes. So for example, we provide the service for Canada, .ca, for the United Kingdom, and for Japan. We also provide the directory service for anyone attempting to reach many of the Fortune 500 or the E2000 sites. So in all, we serve about 4,000 corporations uh, and government departments around the world and about 15 million domain names. I really appreciate you inviting me to speak about uh, the, the particular threats, and I appreciate the fact that the committee has actually uh, taken an interest. Uh, Probably the oldest reason for incident attacks is that of ego or bragging. There are three real reasons. The perpetrators behind those kinds of attacks are generally young and immature, and they're intent on showing the prowess with uh, computer programming, with little or no regard for the damage that they cause in their attacks. The second, the most common category, is for financial gain. Uh, in this case, the attacks are committed by individuals as well as organized uh, gangs uh, of criminals. They include large spam email that uh, you'd mentioned, uh, the interception and illegal use of computer data, which you'd also mentioned, most commonly bank data and credit card data, uh, extortion schemes, uh, which have been around for quite a while, and distributed denial of service attacks. In uh, DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks, botnets, which are large groups of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and sometimes millions of machines, uh, all working together that have been previously infected uh, will uh, be used and rented uh, by uh, criminals in the underground, not only for themselves, but they rent them out. It's a business. The criminal then commands the botnet to try and reach a specific site. The result is that a website, for example, is hit by millions of packets at the same time in an attempt to overwhelm the site and take it down. Frequently, it's successful. While it, an important thing to note here is that it would require fewer than 10,000 strategically located compromised machines with some, with some reasonable knowledge to disable a sizable portion of the US internet. Doesn't take many machines. Generally though, the, the botnets involve hundreds of thousands because the people who build these botnets have no real cost. They're using our resources and botnets are built almost automatically. In fact, we've seen notes where uh, kids go off to school, come back from school and have a look at how many botnets, how many bots they've added to their botnet while they've been at school. We've actually seen discussion in the underground about that. Another lesser known but very dangerous kind of malicious, uh, malicious behavior exists in cyberspace, which is known as DNS cache poisoning. Uh, this is something that Dan had, had uh, discovered, as you know, uh, last year. Uh, thanks to Dan, we're a lot safer than we were. But uh, effectively what happens with DNS cache poisoning is that your ISPs, uh, caching servers, are poisoned. Uh, the, uh, the DNS is pointed to a fake site when you go to your bank, you end up at a, bank, at a website that looks just like your bank, but actually isn't. It belongs to criminals. And what they do is they ask you for your password, ask for your user ID, and then they go ahead and make use of that to make transfers and to empty your account. The third category to talk about is cyber terrorism, which uh, really uh, relates to generally nation state issues. Over the last two years, there have been at least three public uh, attacks reportedly nation state. Uh, we know that one of them probably is. Uh, you know, uh, countries you will recognize, Estonia, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan. And additionally, the Wall Street Journal reported on April 8th of this year that, uh, uh, as you had mentioned, critical infrastructure facilities had uh, been compromised. Um, it's really important to note over here that while most people are unaware of the attacks, these attacks are going on all the time, and our industry is reasonably successful in being able to actually stop some of those attacks before they become public, but the attacks are occurring all of the time. Uh, the, uh, on April 12th, talking about banking stuff, most of this is theoretical. On April 12th, the DNS servers of a major Brazilian ISP, Virtua, uh, Virtua were compromised. Their cash was poisoned for the entry of one of the largest banks in Brazil, Bradesco, making use of uh, the kinds of things that Dan had uh, talked about. Users of that bank were redirected to a fake website. And the, it took about five hours before the bank and the ISP were able to realize that, in fact, the entry had been poisoned. Uh, the bank uh, w w was uh, reasonably open in their statement when they said approximately 1% of our customers were affected by this. But that represents 
almost 150,000 individuals who could possibly have had their accounts compromised during one event. And this is an event in one country over the course of five hours. Uh, the other uh, event is one that you, you touched on already, uh, and with your indulgence, I'll uh, perhaps expand a bit more, which is on the, uh, uh, the, the Configa uh, botnet, the Configa worm. Uh, th we have an uh, industry group uh, called the Configa Working Group, an unofficial group that came together in the private sector to deal with a real threat, an immediate threat of Configa. They've been working around the clock to dismantle the botnet with no real success. On the 8th of April, as you said, it took the first steps with uh, 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 version E. You had mentioned earlier that uh, it upgraded from version D to version E. It wasn't just an upgrade. It was also the first time that we got some insight into how the uh, botnet was actually going to be used. It was used to uh, uh, sell fake antivirus. If you've seen those pop-ups on uh, your computer screen where there's a message that says that you're infected, you normally expect that to show from your antivirus software. In fact, if you're infected with Configa, there are no messages from your antivirus software. It was actually from the criminal group behind it. Uh, they then advertise uh, some software that you, could that you could purchase online there and then, enter your credit card information, your personal information, and download their software. Of course, their software didn't disable the, the uh, virus. It installed uh, more uh, uh, malicious uh, software, and the job is now even more difficult. Uh, as a sobering side note on this, uh, last month, in collaboration with one of the other members of the Configa Working Group uh, from Georgia Tech, we identified at least 300 critical medical devices from a single manufacturer. We stumbled on it. Uh, it's not that easy to tell what it is. There were 300, at least 300 uh, medical devices that were infected with Configa. The hospitals had no idea. The manufacturer had no idea. When we called them, they were obviously shocked. Uh, these devices are used in hospitals to allow doctors to view high-intensity scans MRI, for example, CT scans, and they're often found in or near IC, uh, ICU uh, facilities. Uh, they connected to local area networks. They should never, ever have been connected to the internet, and according to the manufacturers, they weren't. However, they were connected at some stage to the internet because they were infected, and they were checking in with us. The way that we know they're infected is that we run systems that those uh, devices will connect to. Worse, after we'd notified the manufacturer and the hospitals involved, and we're obviously doing our best, the hospitals around the world, we were told that because of FDA rules uh, that they refer to as uh, 510K regulations, 90 days notice was required before the systems could be modified to remove the infections and the vulnerabilities. In some cases, clearly, there can be a disconnect between government rules, which are meant to protect consumers, and today's cyber threats, which sometimes result in delaying and hindering the ability to fix problems as in the medical system. So based on my long experience in operating large networks connected uh, to the internet, I think one of the most important areas for Congress to concentrate on is improving the communication both between the public and the private sectors and across uh, those sectors. The Department of Homeland Security operates US CERT, which as part of its mission acts as a liaison between the public and private sectors. It's a start, but in my view, it's woefully understaffed and it's woefully underfunded for the enormous task that's put before it. Ideally, I'd like to see much more focused uh, collaboration, uh, something that uh, Dan had mentioned and I, and I assume that uh, uh, you've heard before. In summary, we face enormous escalating threats from all parts of cyberspace, both to the economy and to the safety and well-being of our citizens. So beyond the normal perennial call for additional uh, resources, we need to concentrate on improving the collaboration between industry and government, between different government departments and between the US and foreign governments. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to address you and uh, the rest of the committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Chaffee. Our next witness is Larry Clinton. He's the president and CEO of the Internet Security Alliance, an organization that represents corporate security interests and provides a forum for information sharing on information security issues. Mr. Clinton is also a member of the GAO's Experts Panel, which will make recommendations to the Obama Administration on cybersecurity. Mr. Clinton, welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for inviting us to have this hearing, and uh, we are delighted to participate. Mr. Chairman, virtually our entire economy, our defense system, our culture now depend on electronic communication systems that are extremely vulnerable and under constant attack. The vast majority of these systems are owned and operated by the private sector. Unfortunately, virtually all the economic incentives regarding cybersecurity favor the attackers. Attacks are relatively cheap. The area to defend is virtually limitless. 
defense residing in thousands of separate, although connected, systems is difficult to coordinate and expensive compared to the return on investment. The good news is that we know a great deal about how to prevent and stop these attacks. The bad news is we're just not doing it. The PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Information Security Study of over 1,000 companies found that those that followed the industry best practices could prevent, almost entirely mitigate, the attacks against them. The 2008 Data Breach Investigations Report, previously referred to, studied more than 500 forensic engagements over a four-year period and concluded that 87 percent of the breaches could have been avoided if reasonable and identifiable security practices had been followed. Robert Bigman, Chief of Information Assurance for the CIA, has stated publicly that most of the attacks that he sees are not that sophisticated and 80 to 90 percent of them could be prevented with due diligence. However, we cannot solve cybersecurity problems by attempting to adapt 19th century models to a 21st century problem. A common theme from some policymakers who are relatively new to the cybersecurity problem tend to say, well, if industry won't do this on their own, we'll just have to regulate them. The Internet Security Alliance believes that such an approach is short-sighted and does not reflect the necessary understanding of the new breed of technologies and created by the Internet to begin with. A federal regulatory mandates are best designed to combat corporate malfeasance, and that's not the problem we're facing with Internet security. Even if Congress were to enact an enlightened statute, it would only have reached to our national borders, and this is an international problem. A set of U.S. regulations would put U.S. industry at a competitive disadvantage in the global marketplace at a time we can least afford it. Specific regulations would likely be too static to the technology, and the threat vectors constantly change, while flexible or conceptual regulations may be too general to have any real effect. Regulations are often subject to political pressure, making minimum standards de facto ceilings, something like what we have with campaign finance. We need a better system, a 21st century system. Fortunately, there are signs that the Obama administration understands the need for a modern approach to cybersecurity that appreciates the economic issues as much as the technical ones. President Obama assigned Melissa Hathaway of the National Security Council to conduct a review of our nation's cybersecurity status. While the report has not been made fully public, Ms. Hathaway did provide a preview a week ago in Silicon Valley. Among the specifics from the report that she did share was acceptance of the principle that, quote, Previous attempts to deal with cybersecurity in isolation have failed in no small part because cybersecurity only succeeds in the context of broader economic progress. In particular, Ms. Hathaway specifically cited the need for government to work with the private sector to, quote, improve market incentives. This is a significant departure from the previous administration's view, which was that the market would emerge spontaneously to address these problems. That did not happen. Ms. Hathaway is correct. We need to improve market incentives. Consistent with this view, the Internet Security Alliance asks Congress to consider enacting what we call the Cyber Safety Act. The Cyber Safety Act is an affirmative and contemporary approach to dealing with the 21st century problems of cybersecurity. In brief, we suggest that government's role is not to prescribe mandatory regulation, but rather provide market incentives for the private sector entities to adopt the security practices and standards and technologies that have already been empirically demonstrated to work. There are a wide range of incentives which have already been used in various sectors of the economy, such as insurance, liability protections, procurement, awards programs, SBA loans, etc. All these achieve government goals. What we're suggesting is that these should now be applied to cybersecurity. Government ought to designate a range of public and private sector entities which can serve as a qualifying set for standards and practices. Government ought to then fund research used to evaluate the standards, practices, and technologies developed on an ongoing basis with the sole criteria being their effectiveness. Private sector entities that can demonstrate compliance with the standards and practices would be deemed effective and would qualify for the incentives. What we're attempting to do here through the Cyber Safety Act is to change the economics of cybersecurity by constructing a market that makes private organizations want to continually invest in cybersecurity in their own economic self-interest. Only then can we create the sort of sustainable and evolving system of cybersecurity that we need. The purpose of this system is to defend the national security's interest, and thus it is worth the relatively modest investment that the government would have to make in order to provide the incentives. 
The present research and the expert testimony shows that by motivating the widespread adoption of the practices that have already been demonstrated to work, the vast majority of the problem we're experiencing can be quickly addressed. However, there is a small but critical 10 to 15 percent of attacks that will not be addressed in this fashion. My written statement goes into some detail on a number of these problems, including the supply chain, the incongruity with laws that were written in the uh, 1980s to current technology, uh, the uh, need to change the basis for security from, from uh, protecting the, uh, the instruments like the computers to protecting the data itself. All of these will require a lot more work than what we're proposing with the Cyber and Safety Act. We look forward to working with the committee both to address the 90 percent of the problem that's basically low-hanging fruit as well as the 10 percent of the problem that's going to require substantial more work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. Our final panelist before we begin questions is uh, Gregory Nojim. He is a senior counsel and director of the Project on Freedom, Security and Technology at the Center for Democracy and Technology. He has been integral in bringing together broad coalitions from across the political spectrum to limit the threats to privacy and civil liberties posed by government monitoring of the Internet and other communications. Mr. Nojim, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Weiner. Um, it is really a pleasure to testify today on behalf of CDT. Um, our organization is a nonprofit organization and we are dedicated to keeping the Internet open, innovative and free. So it won't surprise you that most of my comments today will focus on the communications infrastructure as opposed to other infrastructure systems and in particular on the Internet. Cybersecurity policy should distinguish between government systems and systems that are owned and operated by the private sector. Policy toward government systems can be much more prescriptive. It can be much more top-down than, than policy toward private systems. Congress should also distinguish between the elements of the critical infrastructure operated by the private sector that primarily support free speech and those that do not. And as an example, measures that might be appropriate for securing the control systems of a pipeline, they might not be right for securing the Internet. It might be wise, for example, to require a particular kind of authentication of a user of an information system that controls a pipeline. But it might not be wise to require that same kind of authentication for a computer user uh, in the privacy of their own home while they are surfing the Internet. Mm -hmm. The characteristics that have made the Internet successful, openness, decentralization, user control, things that you mentioned in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, these things can be put at risk if heavy-handed cybersecurity policies are applied to all critical infrastructure. This subcommittee should make protection of these attributes part and a central part of its cybersecurity mission. It is also important to ensure that cybersecurity measures do not result in a governmental entity monitoring private communications networks for intrusions. Monitoring these systems is the job of private sector communications providers, and they already do this. The government can help them do a better job. It can help them develop tools that allow communications providers to monitor for intrusions in the least intrusive way. But it should not be in the business of monitoring private networks itself. Nor should the government be in the business of shutting down Internet traffic to compromised critical infrastructure information systems in the private sector. While some have proposed giving the President this extraordinary power over all critical infrastructures, we believe it should extend only to governmental systems. Such authority applied to private systems would empower a President to coerce unwise, even illegal activity. To our knowledge, no circumstance has yet arisen that would justify a presidential order to cut off Internet traffic to a private critical infrastructure system when the operators of that system think it should not be cut off. We also urge you to carefully address two overarching recurring cybersecurity policy problems. The first, excessive secrecy. The subcommittee should work to improve the transparency of the cybersecurity program. Transparency builds trust with the private sector, and that is essential to foster its cooperation. 
it also enhances public understanding of the nature and justification for any impact on users of cybersecurity measures. Transparency also promotes essential accountability. The second overarching problem is improving information sharing between the private sector and the government. Starting with the right questions about information sharing will help in settling on the right answers. Exactly what information held by the private sector has not been shared with the government when it was specifically requested? What reasons were given for the decision not to share? Why aren't existing information sharing structures, I'm sorry, why are existing information sharing structures like US CERT falling short? And what additional market incentives would encourage the private sector to share threat and incident solutions, information solutions? Generally, as you approach these and other cybersecurity problems, we urge you to favor market-based measures over mandates. And we ask that you consider carefully the impact on the internet of measures proposed for securing all critical infrastructure systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin the, the conversation looking at first in, in some, as much as we can do in English, some of how the big stories of the day have emerged. When we read in the, in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere that computer spies have breached a fighter jet project, when the New York Times reports that a vast spy system loots computers in 103 countries, walk me through a little bit about, and, and while you can't answer with certitude, a little bit about how we suspect these things have happened and why it is that the cat is, it, that the cat is a few steps behind the mouse on these things. Maybe, Mr. Kaminsky, you can start. You can choose either one of these. Just walk me through about why this is more complicated than simply saying, let's just read some code, close some back doors, and solve this problem. Excuse me. I would say there tend to be two main ways that attackers seem to be getting in. There are more, but I'll go with two. Uh, the first way is that the software that is exposed on the web for remote access, remote management, remote just data collection, while operating systems themselves have gotten significantly more secure over the last few years, the actual software that's exposed that drives websites tends to be homegrown and very poorly audited. So a very common technique that attackers use is what's known as SQL injection, where they actually communicate with the web front end and messages are sent to the database back end. And the messages, unfortunately, are insufficiently sanitized or cleaned, and the database is caused to uh, uh, run arbitrary attacker software. That is the, the common, most common implementation flaw. The other method is what I referred to earlier in my talk where I was talking about authentication techniques. According to the Verizon Business Report, over four out of ten, you know, four of ten uh, of the times where they saw an actual compromise occur, they actually found that there was remote management, remote management there specifically for third parties, for third party vendors using passwords that were either known or could be easily guessed. So. We don't have the exact details, or at least I certainly do not have the exact details on how the Joint Strike Fighter data was lost. But in terms of what is lost from server side, you'll see either compromises on the website or compromises on remote management through default passwords. One third case which should be brought up is that we do have issues with actual desktops and browsers themselves, where an individual desktop inside of an organization will be compromised through the web browser through what's called a drive-by download. And that drive-by download will cause that individual host to be a jumping off point for an attacker to then attack other assets in the organization. That then leads us to Mr. Clinton's testimony that if you know these things, and these things thankfully keep you in business, Mr. Kaminsky, but it, it, does the panel agree, and maybe Mr. Clinton, you want to expand upon this, that if an overwhelming number of the attacks happen in a certain prescribed way, and that if there are certain steps you can take to protect yourself, and I think Mr. Clinton's testimony was 80 to 90 percent, 
if you follow certain protocols. Is this a problem that you have people being sloppy and what we are looking at is figuring out ways to make them less sloppy? Mr. Clinton, is that a fair summary of, of at least that portion of your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In part, um, I, I wouldn't say that it is necessarily people being sloppy, but there is some sloppiness involved. I would go up a level. Uh, first of all, you know, I would never dream of getting into a technical discussion with my colleague on the right. I'll just accept everything he says is true. I would operate at a different level. Um, he can tell you in great detail why a particular attack happened. But once we plug that hole, the attackers are going to move to another hole. So while we can, you know, patch various uh, uh, holes in the Internet, they're going to continually to find new holes. What we have to do, in our opinion, is change the system. We have to change the economics of it. The reason we don't have all these things patched in the first place is because users don't like security. Makes it harder to use. Costs money. Businesses don't like it. Um, what we have to do is change the system so that instead of people trying to view cybersecurity as a cost center or a bother, they've got to view it as something they want to do so that we can change the economic uh, dynamics of it. And that's what we're arguing for. So um, uh, it is certainly true that if we had the right incentives, uh, people could fairly quickly and easily, according to the research and, and the CIA, um, could reasonably uh, mitigate enormous percentages. I'm not sure if it really is 90 percent, but that's what several studies say. If it was 80 percent, it would be an enormous uh, advantage, um, and we would have to do this on a continuing basis. Once we put up a system of, of which we implemented all the best practices that the Verizon study suggests, and we were able to stop this at 80 percent, we would have to continue to work on that system because the attackers are going to say, okay, they've plugged all those holes, we're going to go after some others. And so we have to do this on an ongoing basis so the system has to continually grow because the system continually grows and changes. You know, but d d doesn't this face the conflict then that it's in Google's interest to patch things that attack Google? It's in Verizon's interest, notwithstanding this industry-wide report, to attach thing to attack things that attack Verizon. Right. Where does the systematic conversation happen? I mean, Mr. Nojim raises concerns about we, the government, entering into that field. But where should that conversation happen where someone is thinking about the system-wide protection? I mean, what is the recommendation of the witnesses on that front? Ms. Kaminsky? Too much of this discussion happens in the context of how can we apply more pressure to people? How can we push them? How can we force them? Or at least the nicest way, how can we incentivize them? I don't think enough of the discussion happens around how can we reduce the cost of delivering a secure solution. Users don't like security because security is too expensive and too difficult to deploy. Some of the most expensive failed information technology projects in the world, we're talking at the $100 million scale and up, have been in systems that have attempted to do cryptographically asserted authentication. The role, a major role that government can play here is in giving all companies, giving Google, giving Verizon, giving Microsoft, giving us all one shared base that we can start building trust on. The Department of Commerce is doing an enormous amount of painful and thankless work to get DNSSEC to be something that can actually work with a central root of trust. The advantage to this is not just that we fix DNS. It's that we take so much of security technology, which has been a lot of promise and not as much user opting in as we might like, to make this stuff inexpensive enough so that it is actually something that can be deployed. People want security, but they want their systems to work after and they don't want their costs to explode. DNSSEC can help that. If I could just quickly, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I would agree with, with what he says, but to get to your uh, broader issue of how do we get everybody to do this, it's because everybody has got to see some sort of uh, benefit to doing it. I mean, the problem that we have is this is a joint system, and the, the, the vulnerability is distributed. And they may be trying to get to uh, China, for example, maybe trying to get to the Pentagon, 
They don't attack the Pentagon directly. They don't even attack Raytheon that's linked to the Pentagon. They attack Raytheon's subcontractor. And by, and by getting to Raytheon's subcontractor, they get to Raytheon, and through that they get into, so we have to get out to that subcontractor. And the subcontract, and the current system is, well, the Pentagon says, we'll give a, a contract to Raytheon, and they'll enhance their security, which they do. They have real good security. And we'll tell them to enforce it on the subcontractor. And so Raytheon attempts to do this, and the subcontractor says, I'm sorry, it's just not worth it for me. I don't want the business. I mean, this is like 5% of my business. I'm not going to change over my entire information security system to take this. They walk away from the business, which is bad from everybody's point of view. What we're advocating is we need to have an incentive in place, a small business loan, uh, an insurance benefit, something. There's lots of them. So that the subcontractor now wants to keep his or her security uh, completely up to date so that we have an incentive for Raytheon, that's a procurement contract, we have an incentive for the subcontractor, maybe, you know, the ability to get an SBA loan or a lower insurance rate, and so that everybody has a system. We need a, a, a system-wide set of incentives, and the incentives are going to be different for different people. This is not a one-size-fits-all world. We have to stop thinking of it that way. We need a network of incentives to address a network security issue. It is, it is puzzling, though, it is puzzling, though, that we, we need to offer incentives for a government contractor of Raytheon to do what is intuitive, which is to not, not share terabytes of information on the Internet with, with, with hackers. I'm not quite sure that the, I mean, it's, it's, it strikes me that, that this gets back to, to the question and answer, how, how you make sure that the silos of security extend, I mean, are, are systematic. Mr. Jaffe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are a couple of fundamental things to think about here. We talk about incentives. Uh, green light is on. Um, there, there's some, there are some fundamental issues. When it comes to incentives, one of the key things that I find when I talk to large corporations that have issues is they say, what's in it for me? And that's really the thing that should drive the incentives. The incentives will be different, but as, as long as you can show someone what's in it for them. One of the problems we have now is, is that there is, the issues uh, affect so many parts of the world and so many parts of the commercial world that people say, why would I step up and fix my part of the problem if other people aren't pick, fixing their part of the problem? Someone else will do it. That's, it seems to be a, a, a driving you know, a theme in most of the meetings that I end up having. And until I can point out how it affects someone specifically, they really say, not our problem. People don't think about it as being their problem. The second thing is that the bad guys are as good as we are. One of the problems that we're facing and doesn't seem to be sort of dealt with much is that the people behind most of these attacks are as good as we are, if not better. For some other reason, it almost seems like the bad guys are us. The level of sophistication, the things that we see, for example, in Configa, using you know, certainly state-of-the-art and best-of-breed techniques. If, if I was a, uh, a university professor grading something like Configa E, it would have a very, very high grade. They've done everything right. We don't seem to be able to do it. Maybe it's because you go to the typical uh, large government contractor, and there are 50 or 60,000 people who are involved with software development in some other way. It seems to be very difficult for us to be able to control that, and there doesn't seem to be enough of an incentive overall for the companies to, to, to take a, a holistic approach until you see the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Then all of a sudden, everyone wakes up. Finally, there, there are two different ways that this happens. One of the ways, and I don't know, uh, obviously I know nothing about the Joint Strike Friday issue, but in many cases, this is determined breaches by, by, by humans where someone works away at finding the problem, they have all the time in the world, they have a lot of patience, and they work their way through breaking into a system, including use, using social engineering. A lot of the things that we found uh, have been as a result of social engineering. The issue with USB uh, 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 drives, for example, which not only was an issue for the federal government, but is an issue with Configa. One of the major reinfection vectors we see now is people clean their machines off, but before they do that, they copy their key documents onto a USB dongle, clean the system, rebuild it, go through all the effort, and plug the dongle back in in order to copy their key documents across, and they get reinfected. That's what we're seeing with Configa. This, the, 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 that's the first way is human breaches. The second way is 
a lot of the attacks aren't as a result of conscious attacks. You get something like Configure or Torbig or one of the large botnets, they go out there and they become like vacuum cleaners. They do their work in an automated process. We don't even know in many cases how systems got infected because they theoretically aren't connected to the internet. But from the, from the, from the, the, the miscreant behind the botnet, what they're able to do is sit and look at the net result of the, of the vacuum clean. If you think about this, there are over 4 million machines currently infected, we think. Within, with Configure. We don't know where many, of the, where many of them are. We see a lot of them check in, but not all of them. If, uh, if, if someone behind that botnet wanted to, all they'd have to do is perhaps use it as a giant search engine. Basically say, show me any document or give me anything that has, in the, has somewhere on the hard drive the word nuclear, the word, word blueprint, the word uh, trigger, Come back and find it for me. And all they have to do is sit back and wait. And over the course of a short period of time, those four million machines will look at their local drives. And because, as we now know, many of them are actually sitting behind corporate firewalls, they'll then examine all of the shared drives. They, they're, they're, they're basically no different than a human sitting behind the computer that's infected. They will look at all the shared drives and examine all of the documents looking for that word. Very little work. Somewhere or other, out of maybe a totally incongruous IP address that, that maybe is even connected to a home modem, they'll find the right set of documents and absorb those, send them back to the miscreant, and before we know it, you have the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, um, just a couple of thoughts on this. Um, one, one is that the bad guys in the, in the fighter jet incident didn't get the best information. They didn't get the most sensitive information. That was on a separate system. And maybe one answer is that at the time of procurement, the government better describes what has to be on a separate system that's not connected to the internet. Um, procurement can be a very powerful tool in, uh, in your war chest, if you will, for dealing with this, with this problem. Um, another thing to think about is that Raytheon is probably protecting its systems in the way that it thinks is most appropriate. It's got people whose uh, job is to do that, and they're acting in the way that they think is best. If the government believes that they should be acting in a different way, that additional security measures should be in place, um, then it should be up to the government to pay for those additional measures. And the compensation could um, be through um, credits, could be through tax credits, or it could also be through uh, a procurement um, provision so that um, you get extra money if you take extra steps. Raytheon may not have protected that subsidiary in the same way that it protected other more sensitive systems. If that subsidiary needs to be protected, then maybe Raytheon doesn't get the contract. And if it does get the contract, maybe the contract also pays for such protections. Let me use that as a jumping off point to some of the other threats that some have been realized, some have been unrealized. Can you talk a little bit about the danger of expanding the use of smart metering on our electric grid and the vulnerability that it extends to the notion that our electric grid might be vulnerable? There's some, some of our colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee talked about empowering FERC to regulate these things further. Let's think about not the challenges of the past, but let's think about some of the things that we might be vulnerable to. The electric grid, as I understand it, by and large, is not susceptible to a wide-scale attack because it's, by and large, not attached to the Internet in a large measure. Is it fair that, that I mean, is it, a, is it a source of concern to any members of the panel that our energy infrastructure might be, might be susceptible to attack? Mr. Kaminsky? There's a... There's an old joke from the NSA, which is that all networks are connected. It's just a matter of how fast. Um, the energy industry is, on the one hand, completely different than the rest of technology, and on the other hand, no different at all. The 90s saw a tremendous increase in our use of personal computing technologies and information technologies to, quite frankly, make work more efficient. Energy industry has not been immune from that. One of the technologies that we've seen spreading, at least in recent design, has been an ability for, end, uh, for the actual power meters to communicate with one another, for them to create a peer-to-peer -peer mesh as one meter speaks to another meter or speaks to another meter. This technology is being done, is being done by people who 
frankly, have not had to deal with the last 10 years of attacks. And uh, on analysis, we've seen these meters actually able to be compromised remotely. Um, there is where we are today with the energy industry, which is there's a lot of information systems, there's a lot of communication going on, there's a lot of gear that has trouble dealing with attackers today. <laughs> and the only thing preventing pretty widespread attack is a lack of connectivity, with connectivity growing more and more. That's a temporary, uh, temporary solve. The, the future, the future of widespread meter to meter communication, based on the evidence that I've seen thus far, does have me does have me concerned. I would like to see more security for those meters. Are there steps that can be taken, or is the or is the technology of the smart grid too new to have best practices in this field? I I think we know how to make secure devices. I don't think that that's the problem. I think the problem is that the devices as they've been made have not been made with that knowledge. So this would be the sort of thing that certification and independent evaluation would, uh, would, would improve. So we any... know how to do it. It's just the devices that have built thus far, when we actually test them, they, they tend to fall over. Mr. Jaffe. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the biggest problems that we face is that the Internet was never designed to do the things that it's doing today. There are control systems, there are systems that were never designed to be on the open internet. But the open internet, one of the great values is the fact that it allows you to communicate fairly cheaply and fairly easily with other computing devices. Traditionally, we used point-to-point -point connections. Uh, there are uh, home monitoring devices for people who uh, have medical conditions that traditionally made use of a dial-up line and a dial-up modem to communicate back to a doctor's office or to a hospital. And people realized very rapidly that if you made use of the internet, the existing cable connection or DSL connection, you could have much faster, much more reliable connectivity. And so the devices were moved onto the open internet without understanding from a design point of view that at that point, the security requirements were different. The same thing is happening in the power industry. The power industry devices are being developed by not necessarily people who are in the power industry, but people who are in the computing industry. So they develop devices, and the devices are then used by the power industry who are used to a closed network. But by its very nature, those home devices, the, 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 the uh, smart uh, meters, are going to have to rely on an open internet. If they made use of the technology that the power industry was used to, which is point-to-point -point secured connections, or in fact the same uh, uh, techniques that, that existed in the uh, phone industry, there wouldn't be an issue. But there's a disconnect between them. It, perhaps it's an educational issue where you have, you, you have the wrong groups of people getting the right training. Um, you know, as, as Dan had mentioned over there, we certainly know that uh, uh, security is an issue. But the people that build the devices, when they first design them, don't think about security first. They think about functionality first. And security is an afterthought. And it really shouldn't be. It should be embedded in the system. Mr. You are Mr. Clinton. Just, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I agree with, uh, with Mr. Uh, Kaminsky and Mr. Jaffe, uh, both with regard to the fact that we, need, uh, that we can build more secure devices. They will be more expensive. Um, but the point that I want to add is that we also have to operate these systems mm -hmm. better. Uh, the single biggest vulnerability that we have is not technical at all. It is the insider threat, depending on your, which study you read. A third to half of the problems that we have are people on the inside. These are people with keys to the technology. You could have the best technology in the world, the best security in the world, but if you just fired your IT guy and he's put in a back door and he wants to come into your system, he'll do it. Um, and that's 30 to 50 percent of the problem. So we not only need to have good technology, we need to have incentives for people to want to use the technology. Again, this is a system-wide problem. It involves technology, involves human resources, involves economy, involves uh, legal compliance, a variety of things. It's, it's not going to be fixed when somebody comes up with a new device. I want to talk about a couple more you know, emerging threats, but before I do, I think it, we, we should touch on a little bit more the Conficker 
what, what the sta state of play today is. It's roughly, well, it's exactly one month from that April 1st, you know, the, 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 the day Conficker was supposed to bite. There have been some things that have happened since then. Um, who, who would be best, maybe it would be you, Mr. Kaminsky, who, to, to tell us what is the state of play with Conficker right now, whether it's still something people should be concerned about. And more, and more troubling to a layman like myself is why is it that we literally have the code right there in front of us, and it's such a vexing issue. What does it say? What is it doing? It seems to me that there has to be at least someone who, ha who can read that who, who is at least as smart as the guy who wrote it and say this is this thing is going to it's going to turn all the microwaves on or something? Can, can, can you give us and again uh, you know as best you can in 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 English language? I know how difficult that it, that is when you're dealing with these technical matters. Wh where does it stand? Are we going to get up to configure P and then are we going to find out what this is about? Tell us a little bit about where it stands, whether we're learning anything, and and just give us an update on where we are with that. Not a problem. So it used to be that if someone wrote malicious software, they wrote it, it was out there, you could analyze it, tear it apart, figure out exactly what it was and what it was going to do. That's how things used to be. Um, the new generation of attacks are not about it does what it does and it can't do anything more. The new generation of attacks are all, as, uh, as Mr. Jaffe said, are all very much about go back to the attacker and find out what would you like. Would you like me to search for documents? Would you like me to search for updates? Would you like me to do anything, anything you can possibly imagine, good sir? So that's what's made things difficult. Configure is quite possibly the single most analyzed piece of software in the last 10 years. But we can't tell you everything it's going to do because we don't know. Because the attackers have not issued the commands or have not released the actual software in a general sense. It always goes and retrieves updates. What made Configure special and what continues to make it special is that it's actively being maintained and actively defending against the security community's efforts. Now that doesn't mean the security community has been lost, for, has been lost and unable to do anything about it. We've had entire months of uh, restricting Configure's ability to update itself and manage itself through the public-private partnership of uh, the Configure Working Group, Configure's in, Configure B's entire update strategy was, uh, was pretty, pretty tightly constrained. That's what ended up leading to their need to do an April 1st date. Or on April 1st, they moved from the defenses that were successful in February and March to what we were unable to defend against in April. Technical terms, they moved from using 250 domain names a day which we could register to 50,000 domain names a day, which would be too difficult in order in, to, uh, to block. The state of play as it is today is we have very, very good tools for quickly scanning networks, identifying where Configure is so that it can be quickly cleaned. It wasn't, in order to actually get rid of Configure, it was never, at least in my perspective, about how do we pressure people into doing it because pressure will only go so far, was how do we make it less expensive, less difficult, less time intensive to actually find this on networks? Since a little bit before April 1st, we have had fantastic tools for sweeping networks to find this. Now it's just a matter of people running those tools and cleaning it off their networks. There are still a few million nodes, but it's going down every day. You said that Configure had the ability to go from 250 to 50,000 with an order. Can it keep ahead of you by, or, or, are you, or are you now closing more doors than it's opening as it goes day by day? I know, uh, I know Mr. Jaffe would like to talk, so I'll yield time to him in a second. But I will say that I don't think we will be able to stop the Configure authors from sending updates. I do, however, think we will always be able to detect Configure infected hosts. The Configure authors are doing a lot to try to defend themselves from being found and caught. The place where I think we have a sustainable advantage is it appears no matter what they do, we can always find them so that we can determine we need to clear them. And let me ask you this in terms of this, this being the new state, the, 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 the new state of the art in, in these things. Are other hackers and other troublemakers able to look at the Configure virus and say, huh, that's a cool way or a 
vexing way or a troublesome way for us to do our business in the future. Have we now, is there now out in the world this new model which is going to mean that the cat and mouse game is going to extend to other hackers who are going to use the same device? Honestly, I think that's a fair statement of the situation. One person has gone ahead and really taken a lot of the, uh, if you want to call them worst practices as opposed to best practices, someone has actually demonstrated the worst practices for actually how you make something that doesn't just compromise a network today, but have a sustainable advantage, an updatable advantage. So uh, I do think we will see more things of that type. Mr. Jaffe, do you have anything to add on that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> there's an interesting thing to note about Configa and April 1st. Most of the press saw April 1st as being the day when Configa would suddenly erupt. It was going to be like Y2K. We knew already we'd been able to disassemble a, a fair amount of the, the uh, software. We knew that April 1st represented one thing only, which was a change in the mechanism that Configa was going to make use of. Up until then, as uh, Mr. Kaminsky had, had mentioned, we'd been able to control, we thought we'd been able to control the spread of it. They changed the mechanism on April 1st. But on April 7th, and April 8th, as you'd pointed out, it went to Configa E. Configa E did two things. The first thing it did is it updated Configa D to a new mechanism for, for both spreading and communicating. The second thing that it did was that it enabled the download of another piece of software called Welladec, which is, which is another form of malicious software. Um, it enabled the download and installation of that with some very interesting pieces to it. Uh, the, we don't know if the authors of Welladec are the same as the authors of Configa, but it's very clear that these are businessmen. What Configa seems to have done is downloaded Welladec, but done it for two weeks only. It's a very interesting process. It's almost as if they, that the, the authors of uh, Configa rented the use of Configa to the authors of Welladec to download Welladec and after two weeks to delete it. What we've been able to see from disassembling some of it is that uh, I think it's on May 3rd or May 5th, any installations of Walladec that were done via uh, Configa will be deleted. These people are very, very smart. One of the things you'd ask is, don't we know who's behind it? Can't we interrupt it? The cryptography that's used in authenticating between the controller and these machines is so sophisticated in fact, it didn't exist in the public. The particular thing they're using, uh, uh, which is something called MD6, um, was actually submitted for uh, the NIST competition for the new cryptography that will be, that will be sort of authorized for uh, the government networks in, I think, 2013. They had used this five weeks after the submission from Ron Rivest. They had, they had this in place and they're using it. It uses a level of cryptography that as far as we know in the private world, there aren't enough computing cycles to be able to crack that in any way. It's being used to authenticate the updates. So we, we can see the software, we know the machines are infected, we can disinfect machines with a lot of effort, but what we cannot do is something that people have said, isn't it simple to just act as if you're the controller and tell the, 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 the worm to disable itself? The worm doesn't listen to us because we don't have the right signature. We don't have that crypto capability. They're doing a much better job, job with uh, cryptography than we are. In so, so is it, it, could it be, or is this, this is detective work, but is one of the emerging theories that what, what Configure is, is a delivery, de delivery device for or a distribution device for other, for other uh, spammers or hackers or, or malware deliveries, you know, like we'll rent it to you, this is a great, this is a great moving vehicle, for two weeks we'll let you use it and we're going to go rent it to someone else for the next two weeks and this is just the way it gets around? It's all about monetization. It's about what can they do to make money from their millions and millions of infected nodes. In this case, they have made money by renting it to other people who have their own strategies. The one thing I'd really like the committee to be aware of is there's no reason what Configure does to one company is the same thing it does to another company. There's no reason what Configure does to one computer is, any, is going to be the same as what it does to another. It's an operating system. It pretty much is. It's a remote control mechanism and you can make an individual host one host do one thing, another one do another. Right. If that's the best way you can make money, that go right ahead. Let me, let me just, Mr. Nojo, we're, we're going to go into your wheelhouse in a moment deciding who should crack down on this, but I just want to touch on two more potential 
uh, you know, horrors of the future, if not the present. <laughs> One is the proliferation of mobile computing devices, cellular devices, wireless devices. Is the is there a reason why we haven't seen, and maybe we have, but not in the same highly publicized way, the wide-scale hacking of those devices, those that we're all more dependent on, more computing is now going there, more of the communications is now going to handheld devices. Is this the next frontier of cyber warfare? Has it already kind of, is the cyber security threats already begun there? Are there reasons why it's less able to do because the technology is not as, sophistic as sophisticated as, as a network? Um, to, to tell me if there is if there's reason, if there's reason to believe that that could be a vulnerability of the future. So uh, mobile phones are no more, mobile phones have become operating systems. They are actually quite a bit more complex than the computers we were using back in the 90s. Uh, the reason we have not seen attacks against them in a significant count thus far is not because they're more secure. Any engineer who's actually taken a look has, uh, I don't want to say run away screaming, but has certainly found themselves concerned. Um, the bad guys figure things out, but not immediately. Uh, we are basically enjoying something of a time lag in between when there's awareness of there being a problem and when the attackers have built up the expertise to be able to exploit it. This will change. This will change over the years, mainly because at the end of the day, all the things that we've managed to really clean up in operating systems and really fix up there, not all of them have made it into the mobile phones at this time. That's just the reality of things. And Mr. Mr. Clinton, do, do you see the sense of the infrastructure limitations and the infrastructure vulnerabilities have been addressed? I guess one reason that we'd be easier to predict is there's a, a finite number of wireless carriers with a finite number of tech, technological pinch points. Um, is, is it, is it seem like the industry on the wireless side has gotten has, has taken these best practices and have done what you describe as the need to that 80, 80 to 90 percent of the attacks can be protected if you make best practices? Uh, I, I don't really, uh, I, I, I really don't know if I could say that about the wireless uh, industry. Although, you know, generally the the major carriers do do a, a really pretty good job. Um, the the core problem, though, um, a, as I understand, not to delve too much into areas that Mr. Jaffe and Mr. Kaminsky probably can do better than I am, uh, is is that the internet, as either Mr. Jaffe or Mr. Kaminsky said in their opening statement, is really inherently insecure. I mean, the core protocols that the Internet was built on were built 35 years ago. Nobody was thinking of security. Uh, they're pretty much completely insecure uh, at, their, at their core, which is why we have a patch system to solve these problems. And so long as we're using these core protocols, which are basically the same protocols that we're now using on the mobile systems, um, you know, they're going to be insecure too. And the only thing that, uh, that I would add here is um, I think we need to be careful uh, by focusing just on kind of the high profile uh, issues like uh, Conficker. I mean, I, I do a lot of speeches on this and uh, I'll sometimes go out and, and I'll find people say, you know, I used to hear a lot about the stuff you guys do. There was this love bug and there was blaster and, and I don't hear much about those things anymore, Conficker notwithstanding. Um, I guess you guys solved that. And of course, it's not the case at all. We've simply moved largely from an era, an era five, ten years ago, five years ago, where the hackers were focused on large scale public demonstrations of their ability to an era where we're now really focused on uh, designer malware. And the goal is not to show what you can do, it's to steal money. So, you know, we're really not sure how much stuff is really out there. A lot of the problem with extortion is people are simply buying silence. So um, it, it's, I, I, would, I would caution against just thinking, well, if we can solve corn Ficker kind of things, we've, we've solved this. I think it's, it's, it's harder than that. I just wanted to clarify, there's at least one platform that has really been one mobile platform which has been paranoid for years and years. I can say this because I know the guys. Uh, the BlackBerry Research in Motion people have actually really worked for as long as I've known them to build a secure mobile platform. So at least in that case, I can say people have looked at it and their stuff's pretty good. 
In fact, a lot of people kind of shrug their shoulders at the obama Barry controversy because it's not like President Obama is the first person to ever be putting sensitive information into their BlackBerry. Do you have anything to add? No, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kaminsky, you don't do any consulting work for BlackBerry, do you? No, no, no. Jeff, just want to make sure I didn't get some Apple lobbyist complaining or anything. Go ahead, Mr. Jaffe. One of the things to remember is that the mobile devices used to be telephones but they are now becoming much more of a computing platform. And so while the operating system itself, you know, we go after Microsoft a lot, or we used to, in terms of their operating system, that's not necessarily where the problem is. It's the applications that people download and use on those devices. We're beginning to see, you know, a move towards mobile payments, for example. And one of the things we have to be very careful about is that when we look at the mobile payment applications, they, are, they, they, they sit on top of the operating system, on top of the phone. They have to be looked at on their own because you can have the most secure platform you want. If you have an application that enables problems, it doesn't matter how good the operating system is, the application itself will be insecure. And that's where the problems are, are the, the, most of the problems that we're seeing today are coming from. So don't think of it as a wireless device. It's nothing more than an existing computer that happens to use a wireless network. But it's just as vulnerable and has to be looked at very, very carefully in the same way as we do regular computing devices. And, and finally, on the, the challenges we face, um, how do we know that a router manufactured in China doesn't have some listening ability built into it for Chinese government officials? Or some computer chip that's made doesn't have a, a circuit switch that permits any, anything on that computer to be, to be in, with the right command listened to or going through the right website. How do we know that it's not that hacking in is not the issue, that building in might not be the issue? Ms. Clinton, you're nodding the most furiously, so why don't you start? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're very concerned with this problem. Uh, my organization started three years ago uh, in conjunction with our partners, Carnegie Mellon, to take a look at exactly this problem. And basically, uh, to put it in short form, I think what we're come to the opinion is that we need to learn how to build secure systems, understanding that some of the parts may be insecure. Um, we do think that there is, and, and we've uh, amended to our statement, a fairly extensive um, uh, uh, additional piece of work that we did with Carnegie Mellon and uh, Scott Borg at the Cyber Consequences Unit uh, to move towards developing a framework so that we can put in a, an extended system of uh, protections uh, so that we can supply, so we can secure the IT supply chain, which is inherently globalized, is going to stay inherently globalized, and is going to be built in part by people who we don't know. They don't have a social security system in India. <laughs> We're not going to know who those people are. But we can put in, we think, by using a fairly systemic framework uh, that we've tried to begin the articulation from in some of our additional comments, which we also supplied to Ms. Hathaway, uh, a system where we can, again, change the economics so that we can make it in our best interest and our suppliers' best interest to understand that it is in their best interest to keep these systems uh, truly supplied in a secure fashion um, rather than uh, allow them to be counterfeited or, or in some way uh, hurt. The one thing that I would say uh, in addition to this, is that we try to take a risk management approach to this. And so while we're very secure, we're very worried about the supply chain. This is a, this is a, a problem that is generally not a big problem, we think, for industry. And the reason is it's usually easier and, and, and less costly if you're going to attack Bank of America to attack it through uh, software or one of these traditional hacks. It's much harder. Uh, to uh, and, and, and more difficult to do it through a supply chain attack by putting something in, in a computer. However, from the government's perspective, uh, this is an extremely serious problem because if a weapon system uh, could be infected through a manufactured uh, attack, you can't detect it. You, you don't get rid of it when the software is there, and the uh, the the. The chances, I mean, it is absolutely possible to put in a backdoor or a Trojan horse, uh, a logic bomb that will stay there 
and not be activated until we launch a weapon system, and then the weapon system could either not work or turn around and go against us. So it's a very serious problem. And if you're a nation state and you're thinking of weapons of mass destruction, then a supply chain attack could become very attractive to you, much more attractive to you than if you're just trying to steal credit card information. Let me just pick up on something that you said. It's easier to do it not on the supply chain. What if you're the if you're a nation, if you're China and you have a lot of manufacturing going on within your boundaries and you have the ability to manipulate branch managers or whatnot, could it also though be a source for our counter efforts? I mean, don't don't you know we we have one thing we have that the rest of the world. Uh, Envies is our, we have the technological expertise. We have a lot of the companies that manufacture these parts are within our walls. A lot of the, a lot of the, ch the chip manufacturers are U.S.-based companies. Why couldn't we? Why couldn't we? We install things on these chips to make them. You know, if we want to throw a switch as we tiptoe into Mr. Nojim's areas of expertise, why don't we install a s switch that goes into these routers that lets us sh shut them down should they fall into the hands of? of Iran or a, or a foreign power. I mean, it, it seems to me that we might, it, it might actually be in the interest of the Chinese to be doing it to us and the interest of us to be doing it to the Chinese, no? Well, on the, on the, on the weapon system front, as I say, I think this is a real big problem. On the, uh, you know, in terms of more of the economic sort of stuff that we've been discussing here, the personal uh, identifiable information sort of thing, one of the things that, that is a good thing about the globalized economy is that it's frankly not in China's interest to have lack of confidence on the internet or to undermine the American economy. They're big investors in the American economy. Um, so it's probably not so much in their interest to do that. But as I say, if you think of it in a military sense, uh, I would not be shocked to hear that we have people who are thinking about doing it offensively from our point of view. Uh, and certainly the expectation is that some of our opponents are thinking about doing it from their point of view, and that's why this kind of framework uh, that we've suggested in our written uh, testimony is something that really needs to be developed a lot more. Well, can I ask you, Mr. Kaminsky, is if, if I were to manufacture a router that had a, a piece of code or something built into it, would, and you had enough time to look at it, would you find it? It would be difficult. The, the reality is attacks at the level where the actual hardware has been corrupted in the first place, are very, very difficult to find. Uh, the researchers that uh, Mr. Clinton spoke about earlier at Carnegie Mellon University have done some preliminary work to attempting to, do, to detect these actual backdoors, but at the level where it's built, baked into the circuitry, it's, very, it's actually very difficult to find. Um, what, we, what is not difficult, however, is if you're the one doing the baking, you can pretty much make hardware that no matter what software is run on top, you can ultimately get an exploit into that operating system. So whatever operating system, whatever software, if you control the underlying hardware, you control the underlying logic, you can make a backdoor, you will control the, that, that system. And um, although it is true that we have a lot of very creative companies in the United States, the reality is a lot of the development of both hardware and indeed secure software happens outside of the United States, China, India, Taiwan, and so on. That's just the reality of the market as it is today. Well, that's, that sounds, it sounds like a pretty frightening conclusion. So let's start, for, let's start to end the conversation today with talking about the conflict that is going on now within the Obama White House about who should be in charge of this and what they should do. Um, it seems to me, uh, Mr. Nojim, that, that there does seem to be sufficient risk that we do want to give the tools to government to be able to, if the risk grows too big, too fast, to a critical infrastructure, to, the, to our country, to a, a, to a weapon system that might be used against us, there needs to be some check on the basic ethos of the Internet being a completely democratized, fairly loose-knit organization. Now, some have taken that argument to the extension of saying, all right, the supervisory slash governing agency that should be, have to be at the top of the organizational chart in cybersecurity should be an intelligence or defense agency. What do you say? We don't think that's uh, uh, the right approach, and, and there are a few reasons for that. 
um, and, and the agency that we're talking about is the National Security Agency uh, for the most part. <clears throat> NSA has a role, I think, in protecting um, classified government systems, military systems. Um, but it's not necessarily the case, and it probably isn't the case, that the NSA would be the best entity to protect a private system that's not um, in the classified realm, it's not in the defense realm. And, and let me, let me uh, illustrate it this way. If, um, if I'm Mr. Kaminsky and I'm working for Microsoft, I might know my systems better than anyone else would know them. And the fact that the NSA has experience in penetrating other systems of foreign countries abroad doesn't necessarily make it the best entity to protect systems. And also the NSA, it, it wears two hats. And um, those different roles tug in opposite directions in the cybersecurity area. One, it's charged with breaking the codes of foreign governments and penetrating their systems, finding vulnerabilities. But if it was given a lead role in cybersecurity over private systems, that role would conflict. That role would conflict with the need to patch up systems that are being used in the United States. And sometimes it's exactly the same system. So if NSA finds a meaning, vulnerability abroad, Meaning you wouldn't want to tip off a foreign power that you've spotted this weakness because that also might exist in our own? Is that what you're implying, that they might I'm, keep I'm, that under their hat? I'm saying that, they, that, they, that because they wear these two hats of finding the vulnerabilities and then wanting to plug vulnerabilities in the same software that's on our systems, I think that's a very difficult thing for them to handle and that it probably makes them an inappropriate leader. And, and I should add that the, the head of the NSA at the RSA conference just a couple weeks ago said, we don't want this lead role. We don't want to do, be, be doing that. Yeah, I'm, I think there was some element of kabuki dance going on there. No, I'm not, you know. Um, the, the, the rest of the panelists, I mean, this is, this is the big, I think w we all have now understood it, that one of the reasons that this 60-day review is dragged on and one of the reasons that we haven't, I, I don't think there's been an appointment of a chief technology officer yet. I think one of the, one of the re reasons is that they are legitimately hung up on this. Can, a, anyone that can offer them some advice? Is there, is there a need to have all of these disparate agencies that deal with cybersecurity? Is there a need to have them un under one umbrella? Is that overstated? Is that our, our desire to have things be neat and tidy? There does seem to be consensus among folks who have looked at this that, that, uh, that there is too much interagency, back and forth, elbow throwing, and planning on who's responsible for what that doesn't lend itself very well to a true emergency response. Um, do you have any, any advice to offer uh, uh, the President? Uh, Mr. Clinton? First of all, we generally stay away from this because being a private sector organization, we're always telling the government, don't micromanage us, so we generally try to stay away from offering that. One of my board members, apropos of, of my colleagues, uh, would answer this metaphorically by saying if, if uh, the cyber uh, system were a, 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 a soldier on the battlefield with an open wound and the intelligence community were the doctor, the intelligence community's approach to that would be to look into that wound and say, my, isn't that interesting, um, as opposed to fix it, okay? And that's why, and we need people who are going to fix it, not try to exploit the vulnerability. The one piece of advice that we would uh, offer to uh, the administration is regardless of whether you locate this person at the Department of Commerce, such as the Senate bill would suggest, or DHS, where it supposedly is now, or NSA, or whatever, the important thing is not so much where it sits, but that you do have uh, an individual or an organization anyway, it could be a group of individuals, who have actual control over this from the government's perspective. That person needs to have budgetary authority, that person needs to have uh, the ability to uh, oversee the other organizations. It can't be just kind of a, uh, a figurehead position. Um, so it's, it's less important to us where that person sits, although we tend to think it should be you know, somewhere within the White House structure, um, but that that person actually have the ability to do the coordination uh, among things. And we also think that government's first role here is frankly to get government's house in order um, rather than try to figure out 
how they're going to deal with the private sector, which is why I think the model that we've suggested, which is a collaborative model, is something that we would ask the committee to take a look at. There's a scenario that I think has been useful for explaining to people just the scale of problem we have. Consider a situation where a major top ten website is broken into, not directly, but actually through their ad network. The advertising network is made to deliver an exploit for the Adobe Acrobat uh, page so or, uh, document software. The documents are loaded. They cause code execution on anyone who goes to that web page and the code loads up a botnet. That botnet is used to do two things. First, it sends banking credentials from the infected host to the attacker. And second, it floods various websites on the Internet with malicious traffic in a desire to, uh, to force an extortionary attempt to be successful. Now, whose fault is this? Is this the fault of the top ten website? Is it the fault of the ad network? Is it the fault of Adobe? Is it the fault of Microsoft for writing the operating system? Is it the fault of the user for using the operating system? Is it the fault of the bank for having credentials at all? I mean, is it the fault of the people who pay extortionary prices? The people who are bad, the fault is the bad guy. The bad guy caused this, and everybody else has a natural alliance against that bad guy. The problems that we are trying to solve are smeared across company boundaries, are smeared across individual boundaries, and indeed are smeared across the public-private boundary. I, I agree with what's been said earlier. I don't know, I don't think I'm qualified to know who or where there should be authority. But there actually does need to be a coordinating, coordinating authority across all of these desperate actors to guide the public partnership towards actually fixing the scale of problems we, fe we, we face today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, from my point of view, I, like uh, Dan, you know, come from the geek side of the house and we don't play in politics and you know, we're down in the trenches. But I think what's really important is the only way we're going to solve this is by, first of all, acknowledging that there is an issue, which is exactly what uh, you know, uh, uh, the White House has done uh, with uh, the various, uh, the 60 day uh, review process, uh, the, uh, 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 other, the other hearings that have been heard uh, here on the Hill, and this hearing. The fact that we're having this, you know, that this kind of uh, hearing is sort of remarkable to us in uh, the technical world. You know, Eight, nine years ago, this kind of thing, would, none of us would ever have been seen up here unless we were involved in something else. So it's really important that, first of all, there are hearings about it, that we acknowledge there's a problem, and acknowledge that every one of us has a part to play in it. Uh, private industry, the government. At the end of the day, I guess someone has to make a decision when there's a problem. But what we really have to do is make sure that we all get together and talk about the problems and recognize them, because as Dan has said, we all are united against an enemy. The enemy may not be the bad guy who's trying to steal credentials. Nation states also represent problems for us that you sort of mentioned in the routers. I didn't want to go down that path. But nation state threats are just as large and maybe just as damaging, if not more damaging. There are some organizations that don't care about the financial impact or being able to, to download the you know, plans for the Joint Strike Fighter. They want to actually seek the, the complete overturn and maybe the complete destruction of uh, the United States, and that matters as well. We have to all work together um, with, with all of the stakeholders, uh, folks on the technical side, folks on the policy side, uh, uh, people on the business side, to try and f be able to recognize the problems, be able to find solutions, fund the solutions, and build the solutions. And as long as we're doing that, I think on the technical side, we're happy. Who runs it doesn't really matter as long as it works. If it doesn't work, you know, I'm sure in a, in a couple of years' time, there'll be a new leader. Mr. No, Jim, it does matter, doesn't it? I think it does, ultimately, because where the work is located will have an impact on uh, industry participation. And from our perspective, from what we've seen talking to key players in industry, is that one of the things that, that concerns them is that the program hasn't been transparent enough. If they share information, they don't know what's going to be done with it. They don't know where it goes next. They don't know how it will be used. And so there's this natural tendency to hold back, to think about, well, well, what happens next? Where the program is located, where the operations are located, impacts on transparency. And so far, transparency has really been lacking. From our 
view from our perspective, it makes sense to have a coordinating body at the White House to do some policy work, to set budgets, to do that kind of high-level thinking about this. But operations, they need to be uh, at a lower level, I think. Uh, and DHS is a, a natural place for a lot of this work. But perhaps. I mean, I think, I think that there is the concern that this is a this is generally part of a larger conversation about how you foster all that comes from the Internet, good and bad, like how you make sure, you know, we have, as I said in my opening remarks, we have resisted the temptation to be heavy-handed plenty of times before, you know, as the Internet emerged and there were dirty pictures and hateful speech and these other types of things, and sometimes you've gotten it right, and I think we got it wrong with gambling. I think that to some degree we lurch back and forth, but we basically defaulted to a position that said let's try to keep our hands off to the greatest extent possible. I think the vulnerability, and one of the things that my colleagues and I are wrestling with, is that you want to keep the hands off and you don't want to create a situation where you give too much authority to an agency who's used to collecting information, not used to dis disseminating it. Um, but you do want to have a situation where we acknowledge that this is, this does represent a bona fide national security threat. And to whom do you give the authority to do what? Do you give the President the authority to have an on-off switch? I think you referred to this in your testimony. Do you give the President or, the, or the, the NSA or the Commerce Department the authority to go ahead and start experimenting with a second tier of the Internet that says these are things that we're going to use only to plug in high threat or high vulnerability or important things like the electric grid or our military secrets or the like. Um, and I think that one, one of the things that you four gentlemen have been helpful in shedding light on is that, is that we really are going to have another we're going to have more of these headlines. Uh, I think there is, we do need to be cautious. You know, we go through our cycles in, a, in American civic life where we see a couple of people getting bitten by sharks and suddenly we're, oh, there's an explosion of shark bites going on. There have been tens of thousands of these of, of attacks that go on probably during this hearing. Uh, recently, the New York City Police Department said they get attacked about 70,000 times. I think it was a day. Is that right? 70,000 times a day. Um, and we have to make sure that we don't allow the tail to wag the dog here. We want to be thoughtful about it, and I think that your testimony has, uh, has been instructive. And this is also something that I think it's pretty clear that whether it be the Commerce Department, whether it be some role for the FCC, we here in the Commerce Committee, frankly, were created and, and frankly have a history of dealing with, with these issues, looking at not only the security side but the commerce side, the energy. If you look at the things we've talked about today, the, the Internet itself, interstate commerce, energy issues, commerce issues and the like, um, I think that this is probably going to be the committee where a lot of these things are going to get, uh, get discussed even further. Um, before I, I recess, I just want to offer some thanks to some folks who have helped in addition to all of you who have testified. And I, the record is going to remain open if there's anything you'd like to add in written form, any questions or answers you'd like to, you'd like to submit for the record, we'll uh, certainly be, uh, be happy to take it. I just want to thank uh, uh, Tiffany Garicio of my staff, Amy Levine, Tim Powderly, Roger Sherman and Greg Jice of the committee staff, my friends on the, on the minority side, um, and, uh, and all of my colleagues on the, uh, as, as well as the, uh, as the chairman, Mr. Boucher, uh, um, who has been very active involved in many of these issues. I thank you all for your testimony and this adjourns the hearing.